Good evening to our Wednesday night Bible study. We're continuing our, our, our a series in the book of Proverbs. Uh, tonight is lesson 12, and we're going to look at wisdom once again. The topic of wisdom is going to be found throughout the entire book of Proverbs. Solomon brings it up over and over and over again. Uh, this lesson is titled, The Promises of Wisdom. And wisdom is all things good. Let's begin by reading verse 7. For my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing froward or perverse in them. They are plain to him that understandeth, and write to them that find knowledge. Receive my instruction, and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and find out knowledge of witty inventions. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way in the forward mouth do I hate. Counsel is mine, and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. By me kings reign, and princes decree justice. By me princes rule, and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Riches and honor are with me, yea, durable riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold. Does not sound familiar. Who said that? Better than fine gold, yea, fine gold. David said that. And my revenue than choice silver. I lead in the way of righteousness, in the midst of the paths of judgment that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance, and I will fill their treasures. As you read this passage, and as you meditate on this passage, you get the feeling, and this feeling is true, that wisdom is pleading with men of her virtues. She's trying to tell men what she is all about. She's telling men that she is all things good. What value will you place on wisdom? She tells us that she is more valuable than anything this world has to offer. What can this world offer you? Wisdom is worth more than that. What are you willing to trade for wisdom? What are you willing to give up for, for wisdom? And the thing is, the, the irony of wisdom is that if wisdom has so much to offer, then why do people reject her? And the Bible gives us a clue as to why this, and I believe this is, this is true. If you study the book of John, you'll find this verse in John 3, 19 that says, and this is the condemnation, the light is coming to the world. Who is this light that came into the world? Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. That's right. And men, and this is the saddest, one of the saddest statements in the Bible, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Juvenal a Roman poet of the late 1st and 2nd century said this, Bad men hate sin through fear of punishment. Good men hate sin through their love of virtue. And this is a secular man saying these things, and, and there's a lot of truth to what he said. <coughs> now as you study this discourse on wisdom, and we will this evening, you'll find out that this discourse is about the Lord Jesus Christ. Much of the Bible teaching is quite simple. And if you study the teachings of Christ, you'll find something interesting, that it is simple. The teachings of Christ is simple. And the Bible says, likewise, wisdom can be understood by even the simplest of men. You don't need a high IQ to understand the Bible. And that's why the Bible says that the kingdom of God is what? Is made up of what? Children. You have to be in that. Luke 18, 16, Jesus says, Suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Have you ever wondered why he said that? For of such is the kingdom of God. Because it, it takes childlike faith to receive Christ as Savior. That's why oftentimes it is easy for young children to get saved, provided the Holy Spirit has convicted them of their need of salvation. And that's why when you're dealing with young children, it's very important that you let them come to this decision of their own free will without exerting pressure on them. One of the things I wanted when I, when I had children was I wanted my children to get saved. And I knew from the Bible a promise that 
my children would get saved if I did the things that God required of me. And I, from little kids, I would read to them every night. I would pray with them every night without fail. And they came to, I don't do it anymore because they are of age right now. They can read the Bible on their own. They can pray on their own. Hopefully they can do that. I know they can. But it takes childlike faith to receive Christ as Savior. What is so difficult about, I am a sinner in need of a Savior. Knowing that Jesus is the only Savior that can cleanse me from my sins. If I believe in Him with my whole heart, then He, can, he, then he will wipe away my sins and give me eternal life. What is so hard about that? But the proud mind says, it can't be that simple. But it is that simple. It is that simple. And I said before the children, uh, I believe every child raised in the right environment uh, could get saved. Could get saved. And if you're a parent here and you're listening to me this evening, uh, do your child a favor. Read with them every day. Pray with them every day. Start when they're real little. Start when they're real little. Uh, Dr. McGee talks about a time he heard a man lecture, but he, he admitted that he couldn't understand what the man was saying. His vocabulary and his uh, method of speech, he said, went right over my head. And he got frustrated and worried about that. Then he says up to one of his professors, and he, and he relayed this to one of the professors. And this is the response he got from this professor. Mr. McGee, you know that when the water is clear, you can see the bottom of the pool, even if it is 60 feet deep. But when the water is muddy, you can't even see the bottom of a hoof print in the middle of the road. Some men are not deep. They are muddy. Have you ever, I've experienced this many times. You're listening to a guy, and he's talking and talking and talking, and five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes into his speech, you realize he really hasn't said anything. He uses all these words, and it's like, where is this guy going? And oftentimes when I confess my faults this evening, when I'm watching a YouTube video, I usually speed it up uh, 1.25, 1.5, 1.75, because I want to go through all that fluff. Get to the point, man, get to the point. Uh, don't muddy the waters. Isaiah 29, 14 says, I want to share this verse after this thought I just shared with you. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a mar marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of the wise men shall perish, and the understanding of the prudent men shall be hid. Isn't that amazing? The people out there, they think they're geniuses, they think they're smart, they think they're wise, but God says, I'm going to make their wisdom perish. I know we're dealing with this coronavirus and it's probably going to be with us for a while. But all these people are, are uh, having their hands up and saying, oh, what shall we do? What shall we do? Uh, interestingly, if I'm going to say this, I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble or not, but I'm going to say it anyways. There's a doctor in New York that came up with a, uh, a regimen that seems to be working. He's uh, prescribing his patients hydroxychloroquine, zinc sulfate, and azithromycin, simple regimen. He says it costs $20 for five days, and his patients are recovering 100%. But you're not going to hear that from the mainstream uh, health authorities. Why? Because they want to make money out of this. I, I firmly believe they want to make money out of this calamity. Uh, I, got a, I mentioned this before. I got an email from a company that I bought some stuff before, and they wanted to sell me a, a mask for $34. They were saying we got the shipment in from China and we want to sell you a mask for $34. Forget this. I'd rather get the coronavirus and give you $34 for a mask. I hope I bought my tongue out. But don't worry. Uh, we'll take care of it. I'll take the, uh, the regimen from, uh, from the doctor in New York. I just wanted to share that with anyone who is listening. If I get in trouble, well, so be it. Uh, I'm glad that the Governor DeSantis, when he shut down the state, he said church services are an essential function. I'm glad he put that in his executive order. I am so glad he put that. So that t pastor in Tampa that was arrested, he needs to get released uh, because of the order. that this, I don't know if you guys heard, but there was a pastor in Tampa that was arrested because he just dismissed the, the uh, social distancing and they still had church anyways. Uh, that's, what I'm, I'm, that's my fear. My fear with all this calamity is that Christians are going to get comfortable, and they're going to stay home, and when things are back to normal again, they're going to say, oh, it was fun staying home, not going to church. And they're going to keep staying home. That's my fear. 
humanly speaking, I shouldn't be afraid of that, but I know human, I know human nature. I know human nature. Well, let's go back to our lesson before I chase too many rabbits. Uh, it's amazing that the Bible conveys deep truths in very little words. And you'll find out in this passage that we just read that wisdom is telling us all the things that she is. Wisdom speaks truth. There is no lie in wisdom. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Truth is absolute. You cannot have two truths, or one of them cannot be truth. Otherwise, it is no longer truth. We live in the world where they say truth is relative. Your truth is not my truth. Your way to, you may have your way to God, I have my way to God. They all lead to the same place. That, it, that couldn't be further from the truth. There's only one way to God, and that is through Jesus Christ. And that's what Christ himself said. Someone said, I swear to tell the half-truth, a little of the truth, and a lot of stuff besides the truth. Doesn't that sound familiar today? They say, how do you know if a politician's lying to you? His lips are moving. A wise man tells the truth, a fool tells lies. Wisdom says, to speak wickedness is an abomination to my lips. Just the thought of saying something wrong, wisdom says, I hate it. In Lesson 9, we looked at the seven things that God hates. And guess what was number two on the list? Who remembers what number two was on the list? The first one was pride. Lying lips. Right? Lying. This was number two on the, lips, uh, on the, lips, on the list. And in fact, the Bible tells us that the devil is the father of all lies in John 8, 44. He, because when, when the devil speaks, he is a liar, the Bible says. And then he, all the lies in the world, I believe, are the devil's behind all the lies. All the misinformation, all the disinformation. What I find ironic, I was watching a vid video uh, earlier today, and the, the powers that be, the elites, if I may call them that, are worried about disinformation spreading. They are the biggest culprits. They are the biggest culprits. Wisdom says her words are spoken in righteousness. She says there is nothing forward or perverse in them. We dealt with the topic of uh, forwardness. Uh, when wisdom speaks, she does not want to deceive you or trick you or lead you astray, but to lead you in the way of righteousness. It breaks my heart when people reject the counsel of God. God only has your best interests in mind. That's all. He wants what's best for you. He wants what's good for you. Sometimes I see some, some young people and you want the, what's best for them. But they can't seem to understand that. They can't seem to grasp the concept that what you're telling them, what you're doing in their lives is for their best. It's for their best interest. You have their best interests in mind. But they think you're, you want to ruin their lives by putting all these rules and re regulations in them. You know why we put fences around our homes? To protect our, our people. To protect our families, to protect our possessions. That's why, we, that's why God puts fences around you. Not because He hates you, but because He wants to protect you. We live in an evil world out there. Wisdom speaks plainly. It is very easy to understand wisdom. But, there is a big but here. Uh, it's plain to those who... I know I, knew I was going to get this reaction when I put that in my notes. I knew I was going to get that reaction, but that's okay, I expected it. There's a big but here. What is the big but? It's plain to those who want to find knowledge. Someone said, uh, if you want to understand something, what will you do? You will take the time to study it out. Isn't that the way? If I want to know how to build a, a piece of furniture, I'm going to take some time to study it. Or if I don't want to uh, fix my car, I'm going to watch a couple of YouTube videos on, on how to fix my car. Thank God for YouTube. Saved me a lot of money many times. Acts 17, 11 says, there were, these were more noble, uh, the people in Berea. This is the context of the, what I'm, the verse I'm about to read is people who heard Paul talk about uh, the gospel in Berea. Paul was uh, giving to them something they have never heard before. And this is what Acts 17.11 says. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. The word is the gospel, the gospel of Christ that Paul preached to them. And they searched the scriptures daily 
whether those things were so. The Bible says they were more honorable. Why? Because when they heard the gospel of Christ and Paul told them that the Christ was prophesied that he would come, they, they never heard this before. But what did, what did they do? They searched the Bible to see if the things that Paul was telling them matched the scriptures. And if someone doesn't want to understand, you can quickly see that. Don't waste your time explaining it to them. Matthew 7, 6 says, Give not what that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. Have you ever uh, seen someone you're trying to instruct, and you're trying to tell them what's good, the reaction you get back from them? This tells you, this is an indication of what's in their heart. If you have a child that rebels against your instruction, th the problem is with their heart. So you have to grab a hold of their heart. And only the, the honest truth is only God can change a man's heart. Many, uh, have you ever been attacked by telling people the truth? Many times. You uh, knock on a door and you want to invite someone to church. You want to share the gospel with them. And they just, they, they, they attack you. They attack you. The problem is, it's, it's with their heart. Wisdom tells you to receive her over gold and silver. When I was uh, preparing this lesson, immediately I was reminded of the verse in Acts 3, 6, where Peter said to the cripple, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, do you think it bothered Peter that he had no silver or no gold? Do you think it bothered Peter that he didn't have anything? No, why? Because what did he have that was worth more than That's right. He had Jesus. He had Jesus. I have learned over the years it doesn't pay to argue with people. I just give the people the word of God and let him deal with them. I may entertain a conversation, I may discuss a matter, but I'm not going to get upset over it. I'm not going to start yelling at them because I realize that if I start yelling at them, that's because of my pride. I yell because I'm upset that they're not getting my position or my point. So I know that I'm not going to change someone's point of view. I'll present to them the truth, I'll tell them the Word of God, and leave it at that. Then let God deal with our heart. Because let me tell you this, He is much more capable than I am, by orders of magnitude, of changing someone's heart. Isn't that the truth? All you are responsible for, all we are responsible for, is to sow the seed and to water the seed. Proclaim the truth and pray for their transformation. That's all we can do to a man. Now, if someone wants to engage you in a conversation, obviously, by all means, engage them in a conversation. Defend your faith. Defend the truth. But if you see that they're arguing for the sake of arguing, just go on to the next person. They're just wasting your time. Because all they want to do is just argue. Have you ever met people, people like that? All they want to do is just argue, 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 argue. You, you, you give them a counterpoint and they bring something else. Uh, being of Greek origin... I, when I was younger, I realized that my culture, when I would witness to them about the gospel, they had what's called a blank check mentality. They would just make things up on the fly. They literally would make things up on the fly to justify the position. They just pulled it out of the air. Proverbs 17, 16 says, Wherefore is there a price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing he hath no heart to it? You know what the Bible is telling us? If you do not want wisdom... I want the young people to pay attention here to me. If you, as a young person, don't want wisdom, guess what the Bible calls you? Tell me, what does the Bible call you? A fool. A fool. That's God saying it. Wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. But the riches of this world or wisdom, what would you choose? It's sad that many Americans have made the choice. Have made the choice. It saddens me that uh, one of the things that Christians have left is church. You know, we, uh, I don't care if you're listening to me, I don't care if you get offended at what I'm about to say, but we had a request for some people to set up Zoom so they can, so they can watch the services through the internet. But I wonder how many are actually going to sign up and, and actually join us in the service. I wonder. I wonder sometimes. I wonder sometimes. Christians have made their choice. Many Christians today would rather choose silver and gold over wisdom. 
uh, I'm seeing this calamity transpire before us, and I, I'm not saying that I wish it gets bad, but I want it to get bad enough for people to wake up. People, Americans need a dose of woke. <laughs> a woke, W-O-K-E. They need a big dose of woke. I'm serious. I am. I'm serious. You know. In verse 12, wisdom dwells with prudence. What is prudence? Have you ever uh, looked up the word prudence in the dictionary? Prudence is cautiousness. It is also the ability to govern and discipline oneself by the use of reason. Basically, you're using your faculties to say, okay, if I'm, uh, what I'm about to do is that right or wrong? Use your use your head sometimes. Use your brains. A lot of times, people think us Christians. I've checked out, checked out our brains. That's not further from the truth. God says, let us reason together. There's so much faith for God. I have so much faith. So much evidence for God. So much evidence for Christ. So much evidence for Christianity. You'd be a fool to reject it. Oh, uh, we evolved. Really? Uh, let me ask you this. How come viruses didn't, vi uh, viruses didn't evolve? I was reading someone who was explaining this coronavirus and he says oh uh, the bacteria were so successful that they, did, they didn't need to evolve really <laughs> bacteria was successful <laughs> I wouldn't want to be a bacteria I'd want to evolve into something like a bird or or, a, or perhaps a lion or something like that I wouldn't want to stay as a bacteria In insane these people are insane and then uh, he goes on a few sentences later and he says that bacteria sometimes devolve <laughs> really they choose one to evolve one. I don't get it. I really don't get it. Proverbs 14, 8 says, The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. Don't, don't miss this. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. But the folly of fools is deceit. Prudence is a quality you acquire through wisdom. So, so what will a prudent man do? A prudent man will find the right way. He will find the right way and he will take it. A prudent man will also see the wrong way and avoid it. And what does the Bible say if you're not prudent? You're a, a fool. A fool. Have you ever met fools? I've met some fools. I've had some friends I grew up with. I knew immediately they were fools. Immediately I knew they were fools. And verse 13, wisdom identifies herself with the fear of the Lord. We dealt with this topic in uh, lesson 3 and 4. And then at the end of verse 13, wisdom, wisdom ends up with, do I, these things do I hate. So wisdom is personified here. And we will find out soon that who wisdom really is. In Psalms chapter 25, verse 14, the Bible says, The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him, and He will show them His covenant. One of the things that I've learned as I, and hopefully, I'm not going to say hopefully, as I've matured, as a Christian through the grace of Christ, and I'm not attributing my maturity to myself, but in terms of willingness to allow God to work in my heart, I have learned this thing, that part of understanding the Scriptures, uh, along with understanding the Scriptures, comes a healthy dose of fear of the Lord. You have to fear the Lord. And the Bible says, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him. We, we all want to find hidden truths in the Bible. We all fought, want the Holy Spirit to show things to us as we are reading the Scriptures. But you have to have a healthy dose of the fear of the Lord. You have to approach God with that attitude. The fear of the Lord will lead a man to hate four things according to this passage. Pride, arrogancy, evil, and the forward mouth. Now these, thing, these things go contrary to the character of God. Christ says of Himself, Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for what? I am what? Meek and lowly in heart. Ye shall find rest unto your souls. Do you know who is making this statement? The God who made the entire universe. is saying to you and I, I am meek and lowly in heart. The God that saved you, the God that created you, is telling you that he is meek and he is lowly. Imagine God telling you that He's humble. Amazing. Isn't that, isn't that like a, almost like an oxymoron? I'm not, I'm not trying to be irreverent here. 
God is telling you that he is humble. We dealt with a forward person in Lesson 4 and Lesson 5, but just as a quick uh, uh, recap, if you're joining us for the first time, a forward or a perverse man uh, shows a deliberate and obstinate desire to behave in a way that is unreasonable or, or contrary. And he often does this regardless of the consequences. Have you, have you heard of the expression, to and fro? Yes. Uh, what is to when you're going to something? You're going towards something. Fro means going away. So froward means you're going away from, from God. We've also dealt with pride in Lesson 9. Arrogancy is pride at a different level. Arrogancy is the state of acting superior or self-important in an offensive manner. Not only thinking that you are something, but you are uh, basically you are telling someone in their face, look how good I am. You're being boastful. Uh, a lot of teenagers do that. Or they go in your face and they, they say how good they are. I'm learning a lot from uh, the teens today. I actually have a younger coworker I work with and she's showing me how to do things on the, the computer and uh, put little icons and all that kind of stuff. I, I never knew what emojis were until like a couple of years ago. I never knew what a text message was until 10, 10 or so years ago. My sister calls me up one day and she says, are you getting uh, my text messages? I said, what text messages? I said, how do I know if I'm getting a text message? This was back in about 15 years ago. And she says, a little envelope. I said, I've always wondered what that little envelope was on my phone. <laughs> I kid you not, this is the flip phone. So finally I, I started reading text and then a few years after that I started sending text. It is so painful. I would rather Matt, I would rather pick up the phone and call you. Here I am typing and, and I get frustrated because I know if I would have called you I would have finished what I wanted to tell you before I ended up swipe. I tried that I still can't get the hang of it. Swipe. You know how many times I get the uh, um, pictures of my screen of my phone? In my gallery. I look at my gallery and I see picture after I said, where did these pictures come from? I kid you not. I kid you not. I'm not trying to be funny, but this is the honest truth. I don't know where we're going. All right, let's go back to our lesson. Where are we? Wisdom says, counsel is mine. Good advice comes from wisdom. Always try to find someone who is wise to seek advice. Do not seek advice from a fool. Do not seek advice from a person who has not made anything of their lives. See someone who is successful, go to them and ask for wisdom. You want to go to school? Do not seek advice from a dropout. Wisdom says, I am understanding. Wisdom says, I have strength. Again, this is intimated that wisdom is no, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And here we get into, so I'm going to give you some more verses. This wisdom that we read about in the book of Proverbs is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Isaiah 11.1 1 says, And there shall come forth a rod of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. In verse 2 it says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of what? The Spirit of wisdom and understanding shall rest upon who? Upon the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit of counsel will rest upon him. The spirit of might and the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. All of these things shall rest upon the Lord Jesus Christ. So when Christ was baptized, what rested upon him? The dove, like the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God. And, uh, and in verse 15 and 16 of our passage, oh, I want to read you one more verse. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 3. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. And then we go back to our text here in this uh, Proverbs chapter 8, verse 15 and 16 says, By wisdom kings reign, by wisdom princes decree justice, by wisdom princes rule, by wisdom and uh, nobles rule, and by wisdom all the judges of the earth rule. God has the power to overrule in the affairs of the men, of men. God has the ability to give wisdom to the rulers of the earth. So when you pray for your leaders, pray that God give them wisdom. When I pray for the president, 
I pray that God gives him wisdom and to the leaders, to his cabinet, to those that surround him, that he make make the right decisions. Because the honest truth is, any decision that the president make in a way will affect you and I. It will affect us. Right now, our governor decreed that uh, the whole entire state of Florida would be shut down. It's going to affect us. It's going to affect us. Now, remember Solomon. Would he ask God? Wisdom. Why did he ask God for wisdom? Is that? No, Solomon was a lot older than that. But Josiah was eight years old. Solomon asked wisdom to rule Israel. Because how shall I rule this people? The, re the reason why Solomon asked for wisdom is for God to help him rule the people, the children of Israel. In 1 Kings 4.29, And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. Look at Daniel. Uh, Daniel 4.17. This is the uh, testimony of, of Nebuchadnezzar. And he says this, This matter uh, is by... Well, actually, da Daniel is interpreting... Uh, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, and he says this, This matter is by the decree of the watchers, and the demand by the word of the holy ones, to inherit that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basis of men. So when you read these verses, the question that I come across with is, if God can do all these things, then why doesn't God do it today? If God can change the hearts of a king, if God can give wisdom to the rulers of, of nations, then why doesn't he do it? If God can do all these things, then why do we have such lousy politicians? That's good. We're getting to that. We're getting to that point. The Bible also teaches us that God gives nations rulers according to their own hearts. Remember Israel? The first king that they wanted, who did he give them? He gave them Saul. Because they wanted a king... So God gave them a king after their own heart. Uh, many times God gives you rulers after your own heart. In the uh, book of Jeremiah, there's a, a principle that God will give people a pastor after, their own, after his own heart. And that's why we have to pray for the, the, our leaders, our, those who rule over us. We have to pray for them, that God give them wisdom. Because the decision that they make will affect our lives. Uh, wisdom also loves those who love her. Keep this in the forefront of your mind. Wisdom says she loves them that love her. And those who seek her early shall find her. If there's any doubt who wisdom is, we're going to give you a few more verses. And she'll clear it right up. In Deuteronomy 4.29, the Bible says, But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. What did wisdom say? Seek me early and you shall find me. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, And ye shall seek me and find me. Notice the language here, how similar it is. When ye shall search for me with all your heart. 1 Chronicles 16, 11. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face continually. Do you remember when wisdom says, I have strength? What, do we, what does David say here? Seek the strength of the Lord. Basically, seek wisdom. We will also notice the words spoken by Christ here are akin to those spoken by wisdom. What did wisdom say? I love those who love me. Look what Christ says in John 14, 21. He, ha he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Christ is basically telling us, I love those who love me. People talk about the unconditional love of God. Let me ask you this. How many lost people today know the love of God? None. That's right. It's a, it's, it was not a true question. <laughs> but that's the truth. None of them know the love of God. If God's love is unconditional, then why do they not know the love of God? It can be known. It can be known. But they have to love God first. They have to go and receive the love of God for them to understand and experience the love of God. Some suggested that seeking early, that wisdom says, they that seek me early shall find me, has to do with the age of a person. Uh, they say it, you want to seek wisdom when you're young, and that has some truth to that, because if you look at the statistics, you will find that most people get saved uh, before they're uh, the age of 21. I'm going to read you some t statistics here. 43% of Christians were converted before they were 13 years of age. 43%. 43%. 43%. 
64% of Christians were converted before they were 18 years of age. Another 13% were converted between the ages of 18 and 21, and 23% were converted after the age of 21, but before the age of 30. And only 2% of Christians were converted after the age of 30. Isn't that amazing? Aren't those amazing statistics? So when you see an old person and you witness to them, they only have a 2% chance of getting saved. That's what the statistics say. Now I'm not saying they can't get saved, but they are, the odds are against them. Because what does life do to a person's heart? Life can harden a person's heart. Therefore, the greatest impact the church can have is with the young people in the community. Uh, all the times that we've gotten soul winning and we've heard reports of people getting saved, they were all under the age of 15. It's easy for a young person to get saved. Old people, their hearts harden. Uh, not, not only do their arteries harden, but their hearts also harden, spiritually speaking. But uh, I cannot say emphatically this early here in verse 17 of Proverbs chapter 8 refers to a person's age, but it is possible, it is possible. But I am inclined to say that the early here refers to the early hours of the day. Uh, remember uh, in, in the, uh, the story of creation, when did God seek Adam and Eve? In the cool of the day, which is the morning. The cool of the day. The coolest part of the day is in the morning. In Genesis 3, 8, the Bible says, And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. This is the morning. And Adam and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Look at David. He repeatedly, he repeatedly makes reference to the morning as he seeks the Lord. Psalm 5, 3, he says, My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. Psalm 8, 8 13, But unto thee have I cried, O Lord. And in the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. Psalm 130, verse 6. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. We'll go back to our text. We're going to read a few more verses. And this is going to be the last part of our lesson. Uh, we're going to begin verse 22. Wisdom is from everlasting. Verse 22. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. Wisdom was before the works of old. Do you see that? Very important here. Before God made anything, wisdom says, I was there. And if wisdom is the spirit of Christ, then Christ was there before anything was made. Therefore, Christ could not have been a created being. Eight, eight, Proverbs 8.23 says, I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, wherever the earth was. We're going to comment on that. Wisdom says, I was set up from eternity past. You have to love how God thinks. God says, I was set up from the beginning. And you know what the beginning is for God? Eternity past. You try to comprehend that? You can't understand that as human being. In uh, verse 24, when, they, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass about the face of the depth. When he established the clouds above. When he strengthened the fountains of the deep. When he gave to the sea his decree and the water should not pass his commandment. When he appointed the foundations of the earth. Then I was by him. As one brought up with him. And I was daily his delight. Rejoicing always before him. Sorry, I had the incoming phone call. I, had to, I should have silenced my phone. So I gotta buy myself a pizza now. <laughs> we had a pastor who used to say every time my cell phone used to ring in the church, he would not get mad, but he would say, Oh, you owe me a pizza. And people actually started buying him pizzas every time their, their cell phone rang in the church. Okay, let's go back to uh, the passage here. We're almost done reading the verses. Uh, verse 29. When he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. What a, what a testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ here. The Word of God makes it clear that wisdom is a person, and it's none other than the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In this passage, well, we just read 
the, we, we looked at the eternal wisdom itself herself tells us, tells us that she is eternal. Now, eternality is, a, is uniquely attributed to God, for only God is eternal. Now, when we say eternal, we don't mean eternity future, we mean eternity past also. A man has an eternal soul. Now, you have a beginning, but you have no end. We can understand that concept. But the Bible says God is eternity, is eternal from the past. In any direction you look at it, God exists. Wisdom says she was set up from everlasting. Listen to what John says about Christ in John 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now, think about this for a moment. The Bible says Christ was in the beginning. What beginning is God talking about? We know that Christ is eternal. But the Bible says in the beginning was the Word. But we know that Christ is from everlasting. He was in the beginning that has no beginning. Because in the beginning was the Word. He was before the beginning. Try to, try to, try to meditate on that for a while. And literally your head's going to explode. The Jehovah's Witnesses use this verse. They mistranslate it to prove that Christ was a created being. But you know what? History proves that they were not the first ones. Arius of Alexandria also promoted the idea that Christ was a created being. That he was not God. And you know what verse he used? This verse that we just read here in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22. He argued that Jesus is the wisdom of God. And I believe that Christ is the wisdom of God. I'll show you some verses. Uh, Luke 11 and 49 is one. Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will slay and persecute. Now who is the spirit of prophecy in the, in the Bible? Who knows who, what the spirit of prophecy is in Scripture? the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of Christ is the Spirit of Prophecy. And this guy argued that if, Christ, if wisdom was created then and wisdom was Christ, then Christ had a beginning and He was not eternal. And if He was not eternal, He was not God. You see the reasoning? He, uses, he used Proverbs 8.22 to prove that Christ was created. But 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 120, one twenty four tells us this, But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ don't miss this. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So, who, who is the power of God? Christ. And who is the wisdom of God? Christ. It doesn't take a genius to figure that out. Now, I'm not saying you're not a genius because you figured it out. But, again, uh, let's continue on before I get myself into the trouble. And then here in uh, the last part of our lesson, we're going to quickly look at verses 22 through 29. And here Solomon is describing creation through the eyes of wisdom. And he tells us that wisdom was there during the creative works of God. Jeremiah 10, 12 says, He hath made the earth by his power, he hath established the world by his what? His wisdom. He hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. And John 1, 3 says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And that is the word of God, capital W. And who is the Word of God in our Bible? With the capital W, right. Who is the, what is the Word of God with a small w? The written Word of God. The King James Bible is the only Bible that makes this distinction between the Word of God, Jesus Christ, and the written Word of God by capitalizing the W. So in, in, in your Bible, in the King James Bible, when you see capital W, you know it's referring to Jesus Christ. The created world, even in its cursed state, is so marked by God's wisdom that the careful student will observe God's handiwork in creation. Have you seen? I, have, I love watching those nature documentaries. Sometimes you're, the, the beauty is, is just jaw-dropping. It's, it's like, wow. You see all of the falls and the mountains and, and all the beautiful places that God has created in this world. Even in its cursed state, it is still very beautiful. Psalms 19.1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. What firmament is David talking about here? Who knows what firmament David is talking about here? The firmament shows his handiwork. What is the firmament according to the Bible? It's the sky, heaven, the second heaven. That heaven that separates space, yes. Outer space, it's another good way of putting it. That's a firmament. 
the firmament showeth his handiwork. Have you ever looked up into a into the night sky on a clear night? It's beautiful. You see all the stars. A couple of days ago, we were able to see Venus. It's awesome. It's beautiful. But Romans 1.20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The Bible says that, that creation reveals God. And if, if you, uh, people talk about the heathen, they talk about those who have never heard about Christ. The Bible is clear, and the Bible testifies that creation testifies of God. When you look up into the night sky, you, you have to ask yourself, how did this all get here? And the logical answer is there must be a creator. There must be someone who put all this together. There must be someone who placed us here. And that someone is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God. So we'll end our lesson here. And uh, we'll continue. Uh, we're, we're not quite finished chapter 8. We're almost done. Next week we will finish chapter 8 and get into chapter 9.